Science, technology and culture are changing fundamentally in Civilization 7, perhaps more powerful than they've ever been. Let's kick it off by talking about mastery of both science and culture, and I mean this in more ways than one. Civ 7, of course, like its predecessors, has a technology tree, as well as this time a civic tree, and you'll need science from science buildings and other sources to work your way through the tech tree. This fundamental part hasn't changed. However, almost everything else has, and there are some new additions to make this even stronger than ever before. Let's start by using shipbuilding as our example, a technology within the Exploration Age tech tree, because of course they are age limited. And this one broadly gives us some production, it allows our naval units to cross deep ocean and without any penalty to movement or taking any damage. However, it also has a mastery option. If we research the technology twice, effectively, we'll get plus three combat strength on naval units, and land units can also enter deep ocean. Most technologies, and indeed most civics, will give you a mastery option, providing you with those extra benefits, providing you with maybe a building, but generally they seem to be accompanying benefits, extra things your units can do or achieve. Speaking of the civics, the mastery of science, which is of course deeply linked to the first goal in the first age, well, it's not the only thing that receives this glow up, for civics do as well, and actually even more. Take a listen to what Firaxis had to say. So we're talking about how every um, civ has a tr uh, unique civic tree. Uh, you've created a bunch of these. Why don't you talk about how you kind of came up with the, you know, how many nodes they should have and how involved they should be? Sure. Well, that was a, you know, that was an ongoing process, uh, tr you know, trial and error, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, what looked good, what felt good. Um, the goal here is to have uh, an interesting and engaging tree of approximately three to four civics. Um, mastery is optional for every single civilization, and this is where a lot of your unique content unlocks. Not your unique military unit, those still come from the tech tree, because those are, are typically um, replacements for other units. Um, but this is where you get your traditions, your unique buildings or, or tile improvements, and you can get access to your wonder. Um, you can get it the normal way through techs or civics, but you can also get it this faster is typically here. typically a faster way. Typically. Very interesting. So the technology tree will generally be responsible for our unique units, and it could be responsible for wonders, as well as general progress in the game, of course. However, civics have a newly defined, and I would argue, more powerful role. Let's talk about tempo, changing the speed of the game through both civics and science. Obviously, that mastery unlock is going to be pretty good. All civilian units and support units may enter deep ocean out of cartography, for example, completely unlocking the exploration age. However, there's another option varied at the end of actually all of these trees. Here you can see it on the science tree, though. Let's work with that example. Future tech. It doesn't give you anything. And this is in the second age, so there's still plenty more game to play. What's the deal? Um, we have future civic available because we've completed all of the other base civics that we have um, to choose from. And future civic is has a couple of things available on it, but most notably of which is it adds age progress. So this is a way for you to accelerate through the age a little bit faster and get to um, the end of that crisis if it's if it's really bothering you and you're advanced enough in either tech or or. Um, or civics because future tech also does the it's same also thing. also an interesting tactic in a multiplayer game when you can like pull a lever to control when the game's going to end um, and sort of maybe lock in your lead uh, that's a cool thing to be able to do in a multiplayer game as well i totally agree lots of interest there around speeding up the tempo of the game but also i think we should zoom in on this for a moment the future civic and assumedly also the future technologies give some pretty powerful benefits just quickly interjecting here in post to remind you that we don't yet know everything about the modern age and that age could very much change things up. Just like you changed things up by subscribing, thank you. We crossed over 90,000, which is very exciting. We might just hit 100K by Civ 7 day. Anyway, let's get back to talking just quickly about the future civic research. Firstly, it does seem much more expensive than the other available civics, and that makes sense. It's at the end of the tree. We see the age progress, tactical stuff there, a wildcard attribute, and a boost for your non-civ unique starting civic 
in the next age. So there will be some way to feed through into the next age. Alongside the stuff we've already seen here, of course, the science goals for the first age, providing a little bit of a boost to the age speed with that extra age progression down the bottom, as well as scientific legacy points that we might spend on our leader upgrade. And this is also true, it seems, for at the very least, the future civic, giving us a little bit of an extra point and a bit of an extra boost. Speaking of those civics, you may have picked up on already that there's a special tree for each civilization. Beyond these standard ones that might unlock religion through piety, each civ also has its own unique policy unlocks, its own unique very little civic tree, as Carl introduced at the start of the video, have a listen. So you'll see after we come through transition that your whole government resets and all the policies um, are going to be refreshed. What is very cool is that the civilization unique policies, I think Carl, you wanna bring those up um, and so we can look at which ones we have is Greece. Uh, so anyone that has the um, sort of feather uh, quill type of icon here, uh, those are our three Greek unique policies. Unique policies we typically call traditions and traditions carry forward with you. So those are gonna be the ones that we start the next age with. Very powerful, especially that bit at the end. Start the next age with your previous age's civs, unique civics. You never lose those policies. Right. So you can see how it's, it's really like a tactical choice to pick who that antiquity civ is when oh, you it, think about it. all matters <laughs> and all those choices sort of stack and right. by the end of the game, your empire is a conglomeration of all those choices you've made up until then. And I think that's another great point. This is a layer on top of layer, and it's also the only policy that you'll be able to access at the beginning of an age, exploration age, and then assumedly the modern age as well. So how can civilizations and their leaders take advantage of some of this stuff? And how does Civ 7, the game, look to take advantage of it? Well, of course, science and all the other yields will bleed through in your legacy planning for the next age, and as we've already discussed, your leader attributes. But there's a little bit more to unpack here. Have a listen to Firaxis one more time. Right now I have uh, one of Greece's unique civilian units selected. Uh, they get a, a special type of great person called a Logios, um, and here we have Hypatia, um, who is going to grant additional science on a library building. So we've stationed her there, and I'll go ahead and activate her. So to answer that somewhat common question from the comments of previous videos, great people do in fact return. And of course they relate back to the topic of the video because she was great at science, culture, another very common yield. Though as we unpack them a little bit more, here you can see the Conquistador, a great person with one charge available to Spain in the Second Age. You start to understand that they really do operate a lot like great people of the past. This time you can produce each one once and the cost will increase every time you do it. Han China also sees a similar structure, except for them it's a scholar bureaucrat rather than a conquistador. And these units will have their own, one time, usually triggered ability to produce big yield or some similar benefit. With Spain, of course, it was more about the distant lands. That idea that we discussed last week, where foreign continents can completely change the structure of a game. And for Spain, that is very true. Of course, it's also true to the many leaders inside of the game. Some of them have specific cultural or economic focuses. Take hardship soot here with a plus one culture for every imported resource. That could absolutely stack up, though maybe not quite as much as Confucius might be able to stack some science up and bring it to the table. An expansionist scientific sieve that grows ultra fast, receives extra population for the first city and town as well, I think, by the way, and also plus two science per specialist. Those extra populations that you're growing will each give you plus two science, so long as you're growing up rather than growing out. And we've discussed that many times. This wall will also add culture and increase happiness as well as combat strength for people and units, of course, on the tile. More broadly though, of course, these distant lands and the exploration age provide plenty of other ways to build up your science. As we discussed last week, resource adjacencies have changed. Uh, it's what <laughs> Carl's talking about here, but I've muted him because you heard it last time. Essentially, resources now provide science and production adjacency yields. Now let's bring it all together. Civilization 7 is introducing mastery, a way to double research a lot of technologies and civics giving us extra benefits, extra yield, whatever it may be. 
we can control the tempo of the game through both science and culture. And this could speed up a multiplayer game or a single player one, just trying to get through that crisis event. We've seen the introduction of some policies that carry over, while all of the rest won't. The traditions, the civ unique, civics and policies do carry over, and that'll make them very strong, particularly at the start of a new age, of course, when you have no other option. And there are plenty of civs that can take advantage of this through science and culture, as well as some of those other adjacent mechanics, like the introduction of civilian unique great people. Thank you for joining me in a video that actually turned into a bit more of a deep dive than I'd planned. I hope you liked it. Of course, there is still plenty more to learn, as I mentioned earlier, so stay tuned for that. I'll see you next time.